Today, breakfast with ANZ. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one of the latest posts covering finance and property news with a distinctly Australian and New Zealand flavour. Today I'm joined again by property expert Joe Wilkes. Hello Joe, good to see you again. Good to see you Martin, how are you? Yeah, pretty good. So you had fun, fun breakfast I understand. Yeah, well um, I've managed to squeeze in a couple of things this week, I've tri- tripped to Tauranga and um, on Wednesday morning uh, a good friend of mine kindly invited me to a uh, a breakfast meeting, a, a business club uh, breakfast, and um, oh, very fortunately, the speakers uh, who were lined up were representing, uh, well, not just the ANZ, but the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. So I thought, I better go to this one. <laughs> All right. And you got the uh, the captive audience. <laughs> yeah, well, there were about uh, probably 200, 250 people there. And um, well, you know, you, I think I mentioned in one of our previous posts, I tried to bid on a on a, a dinner with Grant Robertson a few weeks ago, and um, and then I, I, I don't know, I think I fell asleep, didn't look at my phone for a day or two, and I just got blown out of the water by somebody paying ridiculous amounts of money. But for $30 to get the chance to go and do a Q&A after a speech by um, ANZ, I thought, I'd take that. Silly not to, isn't it? Well, absolutely, and you get a free breakfast too. Well, breakfast was very good, actually. Um, but no, well, you, um, the, the speaker that they had prepared for us, Martin, was... Um, uh, Sharon Zollner, who is the chief economist in New Zealand at ANZ. Um, and I thought, God, what an opportunity. What an opportunity to talk about some of the things that are, are intriguing me at the moment. So, um, yeah, so I sent Sharon a, a, a little LinkedIn uh, request on uh, Wednesday morning about seven o'clock. I thought, oh, Mark, I'll just say, look, Sharon, I'm coming. It'd be really nice to have a catch up afterwards. And here's a request to LinkedIn. Um, and then she didn't turn up. <laughs> <laughs> scared her off Joe <laughs> no but we did get the alternative which was a, a really really lovely young chap who um, uh, Michael I won't go any further than that who did a speech um, and the speech was on behalf of the ANZ um, but Michael has had uh, experience at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and um, uh, he's was, been with them for two or three years but he's on secondment at the ANZ now now I'm not sure why someone from the Reserve Bank would be on secondment at the ANZ don't ask that question. <laughs> poacher, and, ask. poacher and gamekeeper, I sort of thought, but no, I, wouldn't, I didn't say it. No, I didn't say it. No, Honestly, no, I didn't. You, well, I was going to, but you said it for me. Um, <laughs> so, no, well, anyway, so he was there. He did a very, very nice speech about the state of the economy. Um, he was talking about the slightly weaker GDP um, and expectations that the GDP will be in the low 2% rather than the 3s and 4s that New Zealand's got used to. Mm. Um, he did a very nice overview of we've got low unemployment and interest rates are low and um, it was quite you know it, it was good for good for the you know the the people there and, and, and uh, I think it's it's um, it's quite encouraging that there are more business leaders and business people in New Zealand who are wanting to find out what what, the, what you know what's going on but what he didn't mention was why we had our rock star days um, and it was because we were growing household credit at nine percent a year in 2016 and, and our gdp was growing at four and a half percent so a lot of our growth was all about the, the massive increase in household debt that year um, and nor did he mention the um uh, i suppose the changing pace of, of credit growth which uh, is still growing massively uh, although the concentration of who's um taking on the, the debt is 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 filtering into a smaller pool of the market. So, um, yeah, no, I, uh, I thought I'd take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions afterwards, um, which we videoed. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm waiting so were, to you, see... were you provocative, Joe? No, I wasn't provocative. No, I was inquisitive. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So, um, no, we asked, we asked a couple of questions and uh, the, the, the kind people in the room were, were good enough to give me the mic. Um, then somebody, um, somebody came up and, uh, and they, they had a question as well, but thankfully nobody else did. So I had a series of questions that I was able to ask. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Joe Wilkes from Digital Finance Analytics. Um, little question you haven't mentioned today the impact of the change in the pace of credit growth. I want to find out whether you, ANZ, and others were looking at the work of people like Mr. Richard Werner and Steve King. Um, so, one of the 
these positives about this cycle we've been in so far um, is that being credit growth has been far more sustainable, um, so growing around kind of five percent across most sectors, um, which is about in line with the, the economy. Um, and that's in contrast to what we saw before the global financial crisis um, in New Zealand and kind of globally, where we had growth in credit from 15 to 20 percent. Um, so one positive aspect there, part of it's been the kind of the regulation which has come through. Um, it seemed more sustainable, and that would be a positive for next time a, a crisis does hit. Um, we are structurally in a better place in terms of the kind of current accounting and all the regulations around the banks as well. Um, so credit growth being more sustainable, um, which, yeah, they should be positive. And are you looking at the work of people like Steve King, Richard Vanner, Martin North? Uh, not specifically, but I have a chat about it. Sounds good. Uh, he responded very, very well, I have to say. Okay. I was impressed with him and I uh, had a nice chat afterwards. But uh, I think that I got a few people in the room thinking about um, actually, this is credit growth that's been growing our economy, um, mm. and uh, that maybe the, uh, the overall understanding of, of macroeconomics has been a little bit too led, led by the banks. Um, I asked him about negative interest rates and um, he was um, not dismissing it. It's been discussed at the RBNZ, it's been discussed uh, at ANZ uh, and actually the day after on Thursday Sharon Zollner who didn't make breakfast with me um, uh, was the uh, focal point of a, a conversation that the, the press have reported on of um, an expectation by ANZ that the cash rate will be at 0.25% by May next year. So they're anticipating three more cuts. I'm still sitting around 65. There's the burden from health and superannuation on the government, but there's also a burden on consumers as well that are still working um, because those dependency ratios increase um, and it's expected to increase from here. So the amount of people who are in the working age um, is getting smaller relative to dependents of those that are older and those that are younger. Um, so potentially that's um, something that's going to weigh on uh, kind of saving decisions and spending decisions going forward. Um, and that's something that's been in training for a while. The scary thing is that a lot of economies are starting to turn um, at the moment. Japan already got there 10 years ago, um, and you can see the effect there in terms of low interest rates, deflation, um, debt burdens. Um, but China and the rest of the developed world is about to tip as well. So the scary thing we, that I've been looking at recently, uh, the one child policy is about to hit China um, in terms of the demographics there. I'm not sure if that's because I was there, but I also took the opportunity because I think it's important to, to um, highlight the recent discussion around the future of cash that the Reserve Bank of New Zealand um, have been having up until the 31st of August. Um, and I, uh, I couldn't help myself. So um, I, I, I said that, well, I've been involved with um, Martin North and John Adams and Robert Barwick of the CEC, um, and we have been questioning uh, the uh, proposals that have been put forward in Australia about the ban on cash transactions over $10,000. Um, is this your view or is the ANZ's view, I asked Mr. Michael, um, uh, that this is why we're having this because there is this expectation of negative interest rates. Um, I think you're a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> um, one final little question for me and then I'll, I'll shut up. But, um, I've been involved uh, with a campaign in Australia because there's legislation that they're trying to get through currently to ban uh, cash transactions over $10,000. Now, my view is that this is a preparation for negative interest rates in Australia. Um, it's not anything to do really with money laundering and the other things that have been suggested. And we've just had our recent consultation, I think, five months on the 31st of August, about the future of cash in the New Zealand economy. Um, have you got any further information from a man on the inside of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand? Also, with ANZ? Uh, so nothing on the inside. Um, <laughs> in terms of, for some, I say more academics, the prospect of moving away from a cash society um, is enticing 
in that for unconventional policies, negative interest rates, um, that cash hoarding is a big constraint on how negative rates can go. So if you have uh, digital cash, then you could impose as negative interest rates um, as you want, really. Um, so there are a few academics who talk about um, we talk about the potential to eliminate cash and then you have more scope um, for much policy to move about. Um, I don't think for New Zealand, based on some of the earlier research from North Africa Bank and that has been published, um, they, there wasn't a movement in favour of banning cash. Um, they still noted there's some um, areas in society that still heavily use cash and actually cash use, or the amount of cash in the economy is increasing over time in contrast to, say, Sweden, where it's actually declining. Um, so I think that still is an important place for cash. Um, and so I don't think that will, that will change in some time soon. That's kind of, the, I think, the way that future and cash project is going. Um, and in terms of the need to ban it to get creative with unconventional policy, I imagine it would be sort of Japan and the, the more desperate central banks that would look to that. Um, and are the RBA? Yeah, well, the RBA. Yeah, I mean, the RBA is, their communication so far has been a lot more reluctant about negative interest rates than the New Zealand uh, Central Bank in terms of some of the comments that Adrian Moore has made. Um, there are natural limits and kind of effective limits to how far interest rates can fall. Um, but I guess, yeah, the, the money laundering is a massive project that's been going on for a while. Um, and yeah, in New Zealand, there's some. Concern, particularly around the regulatory impacts of that, constraining particularly um, money flows around the Pacific Islands as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of lots of things on that side that need to be worked out. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I, I, I also asked him whether or not uh, the Reserve Bank and ANZ were aware of the work of um, Steve Keane, Mr. Richard Werner, um, and Martin North of Digital Finance Analytics. Um, and he was, he did say that he hadn't personally heard of any of those three people. Um, and I said, well, perhaps <laughs> it might be time to do a little bit of investigation. So um, I, I've tried my best, Martin, to put the message out there. And, and there was a, an audience of very intelligent people there who hopefully will go and, and dig a little bit deeper and, and, and start looking at some of the stuff that you're um, you're letting people know of. Mm, well, it's very interesting. And, uh, you know, we had um, a big report here in Australia published by uh, the Reserve Bank here, um, authored by Dr. Tulip, right? And Dr. Tulip yes. is um, uh, quite a well-known um, academic, but also works in the in the Reserve Bank. But what's interesting about that model is that it was completely um, excluded credit as being important in in the way that the model works, right? Yeah. So, and it's remarkable that to think that that is the way that the Reserve Bank in Australia thinks about the economy. In other words, credit, not important. And as you, as you know, and Steve Keane, you know, has said previously, and I continue to say, to me, credit is one of the most critical elements in the overall mix to understand how the economy is doing what it's doing and where it's been and where it's, where it's going. So I wouldn't be surprised to find that in New Zealand they have a rather similar myopic view. I find it quite interesting that the, the senior economists at banks, and I have met a few now, so I've, I've met um, senior economists at, at, at some of the Australian banks, I've met senior economists, of, of, or former senior economists at the um, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and yeah, you're right, credit doesn't seem to factor in, but I think part of it is because there's, there's a lack of education about the way that um, money is created in the modern economy, the fact that it is debt being written um, that creates the money supply and it allows you know, somebody to sell a house at a million to, to, to cash out a bit of the debt that somebody else has taken on to buy it and then go and buy their boats and the cars or whatever. So it's it, it's quite quite astounding. Um, but you know, we'll we'll keep trying to further that, that that education. And I would I'd encourage people to go back to the post that you, you did several months ago, which is the art of money creation. And it's one of the better posts that DFA have done, um, which hasn't actually had the airing that some of our more Blood boy or jokey posts have had. Yeah, well, thank you. No, the the art of money creation. We'll put the link up. Um, really, does go into this this fundamental point that if you understand how the the economy really works, which is that effectively banks can create as much credit as there are people who are willing to borrow it, right? And that basically then flows through the economy, uh, which means effectively that um, there is no limit in theory, to the amount of credit in the system. And, of course, if you um, see credit 
dying, uh, the rate of credit growth, the credit momentum, um, you know, slowing, then there's a very strong signal that effectively home prices will continue to fall and the economy will continue to slide. On the other hand, if credit goes up, the reverse is true. But of course, the problem with credit is that it's debt. Debt needs to be repaid. And there's a limit to how much debt that people can actually um, handle. And that, of course, is the fundamental issue that we keep dealing with and have to keep coming back to because people keep forgetting it. Yeah, well, the um, R, sorry, the RBNZ published their C31 data for the end of July, uh, at the end of August. And you can see that there is this increase in the amount of, of uh, higher loan to value lending taking place. The first time buyers, um, the higher loan to value um, uh, increase was of sort of around around 10% more high loan to value lending to first time buyers than there was this time last year. So it's all it's all very very obvious that there is a a massive requirement at the moment to try and replace the. Um, uh, the, the weakness of, of, of the economy with debt from the young um, to facilitate the, the, the retirement aspirations of the older generation. And it's it's going to be really, really interesting to see what happens if we get to 0.25% by May next year. And I think I predicted in our last post that I thought we'd be at half a percent cash rate by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, how this impacts that, that balance of do the first time buyers want to borrow it? What do the older people do in a very low interest rate environment? And where does the balance kick in in terms of is there going to be more pressure on the sellers of, of property over the the buyers who um, you know all the evidence at the moment points to the fact that buyers are slowing down and holding off yeah and look the last point to make joe is that you've got to ask the question why is it that all of the banks and bank economists around the place are talking rates down because they're actually all doing it now they're all saying oh we should go over much lower you know Th there's a reason right and the, the reason is partly if interest rates are really low, banks will be able to write way more loans and banks rely on volume of new loans being written to support their profitability. So they're talking their own book, right? The yeah. second point is that no one is worrying sufficiently, in my view, about the impact on savers. So in Australia, we have three million households who are reliant on the income from term deposits. And as interest rates go lower, effectively term deposits get crushed. And so uh, all of this focus on credit and driving credit to drive the profitability of the banks is having this spillover effect on those trying to save and trying to relive off income from savings. And so this whole thing is skewed by this same desire to grow the bank's books. And no one that I've seen has written in any of the media that I've seen as to why it is that the banks are talking rates down. But that is the fundamental reason. Yeah, well, the banks have uh, in Australia and New Zealand carried on like there was no GFC um, and that the lending has been ridiculous. Uh, the, <laughs> the the regulation that should have happened in 2009-10 just didn't hit the Southern Hemisphere or it didn't hit this part of the Southern Hemisphere. Um, they, they must be absolutely shitting themselves. Yeah, and that's the point. So, yeah, whenever you hear a bank talking interest rates down, ask yourself the question, what's in it for them? because it's blooming clear. Joe, good to talk to you. Take care, mate. See you later. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.